Well, good afternoon. I'm uh, pleased today to be able to introduce uh, my friend and colleague, Louise Davidson Schmisch, to you. Uh, she and I have a couple of things in common. Uh, one is that we did Fulbrights after undergrad, which is a fun thing that you should all uh, consider doing. Uh, you don't have to wait until you're a grad student to do it. In her case, um, she went to Eastern Germany to a town called Rostock, and she did it uh, not too long before the wall came down and the country was reunified. And um, she wrote a terrific book about how uh, legislators, state-level legislators in Germany, in Eastern Germany in particular, um, sort of learned about party politics because there were new states created on the territory of the old East Germany. And so her first book was about that. Um, her second book, which I brought along and then forgot to bring up with me, but it was actually on the slide, so I'm not sure you get so much benefit from seeing <laughs> this version of it, is called Gender Quotas and Democratic Participation, and she will talk a lot about that today. So I won't say much about it, except it's a terrific book. It came out from the University of Michigan Press two years ago, and I read it with great interest and, and, and to great profit. Um, and the last thing I'll say is that we are also colleagues uh, on a journal called German Politics, which we co-edit. And it's been a delight to work with her and uh, really fun to have her out this week. So looking forward to her remarks, uh, which, as you can see, are tagged to the title of her book, Gender Quotas and Democratic Participation. And I'm pleased to welcome to BYU Louise Davidson Schmisch. Thank you very much, Professor Jacoby, and thanks to all of you for coming and for listening to what I have to say. It's a real honor to be here and to take part in this series. I think um, the series that's been put together does a great job of getting at a really complex and interesting um, topic that can be really viewed from a number of different perspectives. And so I'm, I'm um, very grateful to be able to be here and to give you my perspective on the topic. Um, I'm a political scientist, and one thing that political scientists are interested in is thinking about how we can construct the rules of the game or institutions um, to structure political conflict and structure political decision making in societies. And what I do in this book is to try to consider how we can structure these rules of the game to include a broader um, representativeness of the population in democratic decision making in countries. And so empirically, my focus um, in this book is on Germany, but the ideas that I'm going to be talking about are ideas that are um, employed in places all around the world in many different types of countries. Um, so what I'd like to do today is four different things before we open it up to some questions and answers. Um, the first thing that I'd like to do is give you a brief introduction to the German uh, political system and Germany's political representation. And I think to uh, make it a little more accessible to an American audience, what I'm going to do is to compare the situation in Germany to the situation in the United States and look at the participation of both men and women in the democratic process in those two countries. Um, then what I'd like to do is to take a step back and to think theoretically why in a democracy would we want to have uh, equal participation from men and women in the political process? What's, um, what's to be gained by that, and why is it that entities all around the world are actually focus on, focusing on working to achieve this goal um, in places around the world? Then the third thing that I'd like to do is to talk about the changes to their rules of the game that the Germans made, um, to talk about what gender quotas are and how they're used there and what effects they've had. Um, and then to think about gender quotas as a mechanism, um, both some of the advantages and some of the limitations of this way of achieving um, more gender equitable participation in democracy. And then I'd be happy to um, talk with you about what you're interested in hearing about. Um, so to start off with, you might not know much about German politics, but you probably recognize her. Um, this is Angela Merkel. She's the Chancellor of Germany, which is another, the German word for Prime Minister, or the, the Chief Executive um, of German politics. And she's been in that position since 2005, which I think for most of you is probably um, a good chunk of your lifetime. Um, in 2004, Forbes magazine started making a list of the most powerful women around the world. Um, like I said, Merkel came to power in 2005, and since 2006, she's been number one on that list every single year, except for once, I think maybe they wanted to sell more magazines, so they switched out and they put Michelle Obama on top for one year. Um, 
Forbes also makes a list of the world's most powerful people, male or female, and Merkel's generally on that list too. And here we can see um, Time Magazine has her down as um, someone who has more power than anyone else on the continent in Europe. Um, and so if we look at the executive branch or the chief executive position in Germany, we can see that we have 100% um, female representation Right? And we've had 100% female representation in this position since 2005. Um, if we look at the United States, we can see a contrast, and that is we have 100% male representation in the presidency, and we've had that since the 1700s. Um, Germany, to Germany's credit, Merkel's the first woman that's come to this position of power in Germany. Um, but if we're looking at gender balance and participation in democracy, it's really difficult just to look at the chief executive, right, because that's just one person. Um, so I think it's it's probably more constructive to widen our lens and think about some other leading governmental positions as well. So if we broaden things out and we take a look at the cabinet, we can see similar patterns um, extending out in this direction. So the United States currently, our cabinet contains 20% women and 80% men. Um, and if we look at 186 countries around the world, with one being the most gender balanced cabinet and 186 being the least gender balanced cabinet, we rank right around the middle, position 87 out of 186. Um, and if we look at Germany, Germany ranks in the top 10, so their cabinet is 40% women and 60% men, which is a lot closer to the, the population, um, which in both countries is about 50-50 right now. Um, if we move to the legislative branch, we can see a similar pattern. Um, so the German, uh, the equivalent of the House of Representatives in Germany is the Bundestag, this building over here. Currently, the Bundestag contains 31% women and 69% men, um, which ranks Germany 47 out of 191 countries around the world. Um, if we look at the United States Congress, we are currently at 23% women and 77% men. Um, which ranks the United States 79th out of 191 countries, um, below countries including Iraq and Afghanistan. Um, so uh, the countries look pretty different. What's also really different is the reaction to these figures after the elections were held. So if we think about the United States, if you're interested at all in gender and politics, you might have followed, there's been a lot of excitement in this country. This 23 or 24% figure is a record in the history of our country, right? This is the most, the highest percentage of women that we've ever seen in Congress. People um, who are interested in women's political representation we're really excited about this result. Um, if we look at the German reaction to the 2017 election, Germans were dismayed with this 31% figure. Um, there was a lot of hand-wringing that went on across the country because this was actually the first time in German history that the percentage of women in the Bundestag went down. So prior to the 2017 election, this figure was at 37%, so closer to that 60-40 split that we saw in the cabinet. So Americans celebrating this result and Germans um, being concerned about um, the results that they have. And uh, this, these contrasting patterns are kind of, um, they raise an interesting puzzle for political scientists because a lot of the things that we know about um, what causes political outcomes would lead us to believe that Germany and the United States would look similar. Uh, these are both countries that are long-term democracies, consolidated democracies. These are both affluent countries um, with highly educated female um, uh, populations. They are countries that have a similar kind of cultural heritage. And if we look historically, these countries have had similar patterns of women's representation. So on this graph here, this is um, the percentage of women in the legislative branch. And by legislative branch, I mean here the um, House of Representatives and the Bundestag. Um, our left axis, which I see I forgot to label, is a percentage. So 50% um, would be the legislative um, branch looking like the underlying population. As we can see, neither country over time has, has gotten up to 50%, but we can see um, trends in that direction. The orange line at the bottom represents the United States, and the blue line at the top represents Germany 
And um, we can see here in the 40s and in the 60s and into the 1970s, both countries looked really similar. They had uh, legislatures that were over 90% male, and that figure was pretty flat. Um, if we look at just the Republican Party today in the House and the Senate, that's where the Republican Party is. So they have 10% women in the House and 12% women um, in the Senate. What we see starting to happen in the 1980s is uh, a growing discrepancy between the two countries, right? Both um, the gender balance in the legislative branch starts to increase, but Germ the German increase was at a much more rapid rate um, than the United States. So what happened here that started to lead to this pattern? Uh, the answer is Germans began to uh, change the rules of the game for political life in Germany and choose the, uh, uh, change the way that they choose candidates for elective office. Um, and if you look at um, Germany in comparative context and you study this phenomenon around the world, um, what happened in Germany was the adoption of gender quotas for candidates, and if we look cross-nationally, we can see that quotas are um, probably the most, the single most effective thing that you can do to increase women's descriptive representation in legislative bodies. So this German experience here wasn't necessarily unique to Germany. This, this type of change started taking place um, a lot of places around the world. Um, and if we look at the impact of this, one, um, you can read my book and you can take my word for it or you can read a lot of other scholarship and you can take their word for it um, or you can ask practitioners. Um, so this is Angela Merkel in 1998. She was interviewed by a photographer named Herlinda Kerbel who did a really interesting series of portraits of a number of leading German politicians um, over the course of their careers and she photographed them and interviewed them at regular intervals. And in this 1998 interview, one of the things that Merkel said to um, the photographer was, I have only been able to have a career in my party, and a career in a political party in Germany is important because to become the chancellor, you have to be the head of the party. So you've got to move up this, these ranks to get political power. I have only been able to have a career in my party in part due to the fact that I am a woman and at times it was exactly a woman who was needed. So if you ask Merkel, where did you get your start? How did you get your foot in the door of politics? She attributes that to quotas. Clearly, there's not a quota for the single chancellor and she's been able to hold on to political power since 2005, not because of a quota, but because of her um, consummate skills as a politician, but to get her into a position where she could exercise those skills quotas she feels were very helpful to her. So what exactly are these quotas and how do they work? Um, oh, actually, before, wait, I'm skipping ahead. That's point three. Point two is, before we get there, why is it that countries all around the world have adopted quotas? Why is it that people feel that a gendered imbalance in political representation is a problem for democracies? Um, if we look at this graph over here on the side, um, all the countries that are shaded in a color are countries that use some type of gender quotas to elect officials. So as we can see, this is a, a large number of countries around the world. Um, the different colors represent different types of quotas, and we can talk about that um, later if you're interested. Um, not only are these things that countries are adopting themselves, but these are policies that are being advocated by a number of different international organizations. So the United Nations, the World Bank, the European Union, and even the United States have advocated gender quotas as a way of improving gender balance in political representation around the world. So if we look at Iraq and Afghanistan, the reason why Af Iraq and Afghanistan have more women in their legis legislative branches than do we is because when we went into these countries um, and helped them um, revamp their political systems, uh, one of the things that we demanded that they do would be adopt quotas for women. Um, and so we, we asked them to implement that policy and we can see um, that it was effective in increasing the number of women um, in the legislative branch there. So why is it that all of these countries and all of these organizations have decided that quotas are worth pursuing? Why is it that they feel um, there's a problem when the um, makeup of our government doesn't represent the makeup of our populations in democratic countries? 
Um, and we can think about four main lines of argumentation that have been for put forth to answer these questions. Um, the first of these three draw on work by Hannah Pitkin, who was a political theorist who um, had some theories about how representation or political representation works in democracies. Um, and she talked about three types of representation, descriptive representation, symbolic representation, and substantive representation. Um, and and to her list, I want to add a fourth um, characteristic, which is the quality of representation. So how do these things, um, what implications do these types of representation have for um, why we might want to have a gender balance in political representation. The first thing is the concept of descriptive representation. Um, and the idea of descriptive representation is that if, if democracy is ruled by the people, right, if it's representative democracy, if you think about the word representative, we can break it down into the words represent, right, or present. So we want to have the citizens present when political decisions are made. So if we want to have rule by the people, if we want the people to be present, then we can't just have half the people present at the table when these decisions are made, right? A democratic government should look like its citizens. It should represent the diversity of the citizens um, that are in, in living in that particular country. And when we think about descriptive representation and diversity in representation, that diversity could take a number of different forms, right? This is, these arguments are not just about gender. Um, we can also think about them in terms of race or ethnicity or religion or age um, or area of the country that someone came from. Um, and if we think about the founders of our country, right, for the founders it was very important that the people be descriptive descriptively represented, right? That's why we have the Senate. Every state, whether big or small, gets two representatives because people living in different states are going to have different viewpoints and different perspectives and different concerns. Um, and our founders were very ca careful to craft a political system that would represent and reflect that diversity. Um, they weren't thinking about diversity in other ways, which is probably why they didn't make a system um, that took that into account. But this general principle of descriptive representation, I think, is embodied in the political institutions that we have. Um, and some people also make a normative argument that says it's just not fair um, that big subgroups of the population aren't represented in politics, right? If we think about having um, political jobs, having political power, a really nice health care package, a really nice pension, a lot of media opportunities, chances to fly around the world and enjoy a lot of perks, it's just not fair that some people are systematically excluded from that, right? If we were, um, if we think about when I was a kid at school, you know, if it was somebody's birthday, they'd bring in birthday treats, right? And if some kid brought 10 cupcakes to the class one day and said, all right, nine of these cupcakes are going to go to the boys and they can share them and the girls can share this 10th cupcake together, we instinctively say that's not really fair, right? The kids in the class would complain, the teacher probably would put a stop to it. Um, and so we can make a normative argument that it's just not fair that um, political positions of power are dominated by one group of people and not the other. So that's a, a descriptive argument that we should just simply have the, we, it's only fair that we have um, equal numbers in representation. Um, some people also go further and they talk about symbolic representation. Um, and the fact is that politicians, especially powerful politicians like a president um, or people who are in Congress, are very, very visible people in our society, um, and they serve as role models or they serve as sources of information um, to people in the country about who, who's good at doing politics. Right? So we, we care about who or what our children see because we know they learn about the world and draw inferences from it. Um, and if we systematically grow up in a society where certain people don't fill certain roles, that leads to a perception that those people can't fill those roles. Right? And so sometimes um, people who talk about this, this value of symbolic representation talk about female politicians as role models. Um, and they make the argument, if you, if, you, know, you can't be it if you can't see it. Right? So standing here as a faculty member, when I look at that wall back there, it gives me some indication about who might be a good director of the Kennedy Center. Right? And I, I don't really 
see that I have some good chances there, right? And so that's just one wall in one room, right? But if we grow up looking at a political system where we see this message over and over and over again, that's something um, that that people internalize, right? So it might make women feel like, well, I, you know, that that's what a director looks like. I can't be that, or maybe I'm not really good, or maybe I'm not very qualified. Um, and so we can see where we have gender unequal representation, that women are less likely than men to say that they know a lot about politics or that they're interested in politics. Um, and so if we think about the quality of democracy, right, if we want to have um, a country where citizens are, you know, the idea of democracy is that citizens take part in governing themselves, right? So we want our population to be knowledgeable and interested. And so if we're sending signals that depresses interest among people, that's not very um, effective for the quality of democracy. Um, and it also means that the people who make selections about who should be a candidate or who should be elected might also internalize some of those things, right? So if we don't see um, particular groups of people occupying political positions of leadership, we might think those people aren't particularly good, so we're not going to nominate them or we're not going to vote for them. Um, so there's a real important symbolic aspect to who holds positions of power and positions of leadership. And this is true not just in politics, but in all sorts of different fields of endeavor. Um, we can also think about a third argument for more gender balance in um, political representation, and that is the question of substantive representation. So it's not just a question of it's fair that people share power or that it might have some symbolic importance, but we might actually get different or better political outcomes or better political representation if we have more diverse representatives. Um, because socially um, men and women do oftentimes live very different lives or um, have very different life experiences and life trajectories, they might bring, or they not might, they do bring very different um, perspectives, very different issue concerns, and very different issue priorities to government. So it might be that uh, people within the same party have generally similar views, um, so that if we think about um, uh, child care policies or parental leave policies, right? There might Democrats might say, oh yeah, we you know it's important to give workers good benefits and give people um, policies like paid parental leave, but if um, male Democrats have to pick among a number of different priorities, that might not be the most important thing that they um, feel as a priority. Whereas a female Democrat might say, given my life experience and given the experiences of my friends trying to balance work and family, um, trying to balance you know, giving birth and, and entering the workforce, this is a real priority for me. And it might be something that they, they push for more. And so we can see a number of studies around the world that show that uh, male and female legislators oftentimes have different um, policy priorities or different issue priorities. Um, and so if we look at things like uh, policies addressing violence against women or various health care issues or child care issues, they're oftentimes, um, governments are oftentimes more likely to take up these issues if they have uh, more female representatives. Um, another important reason um, why you might want to have gender balance in representation is that um, some political representation occurs through um, things like party platforms, right? If we know that women favor equal pay, um, and that's in a party platform, it's pretty easy for a male representative to represent that concern in the legislative branch, right? We might not need female legislators to get equal pay legislation because that's a, a concern that men might be able to articulate. Um, political theorist who's a, uh, a Harvard professor, Jane, Jane Mansbridge, talks about why it might be important to have um, uh, women and African Americans and other underrepresented groups in political decision making. And she says where it's particularly important are where we have what's called uncrystallized interests, where maybe suddenly an issue comes up that people hadn't thought about before. Um, it's not necessarily in a party platform. And politicians are sitting around a committee table or sitting in a hearing and have to make a decision and vote on something that. Um, 
hasn't been discussed before. So in those types of situations, people generally fall back on their life experiences. And it might be that men and women have really different life experiences. And if only men are at the table, those female experiences are perhaps less represented. Um, and so I think we can think about a, a good example of this recently in the United States, right? We had the Kavanaugh hearings. Before elections were held, there wasn't, you know, whether or not Kavanaugh should be confirmed for the Supreme Court or how we should interpret those hearings were not a, an issue that was on the table for a policy platform, right? It was something that, that um, people on the Senate Judiciary Committee had to make up their minds about kind of in the spur of the moment when these, these hearings suddenly emerged. And that's kind of an, an idea of uh, an example of an uncrystallized interest where right, people might have, based on their life experiences, different reactions um, to, different, to the same testimony, right? Maybe she's confused, maybe she wasn't sure. I think if I were assaulted, I might remember, right? So different people who have different life experiences might interpret the same information differently in the spur of the moment. Um, and another reason um, why scholars have argued that the substantive representation is important is that if we look around the world in public opinion survey after public opinion survey, we can see that women and men in the same political party oftentimes have different preferences. And generally, almost everywhere in the world, women in are to the left economically um, of men within their own party. So we wouldn't expect, for example, Republican women and um, Democratic women to have the same budget preferences, right? Republican women are gonna favor less government spending and probably lower levels of social programs. But if we were to compare Republican women to Republican men, we'd probably find a systematic difference that the women would be willing within that, kind of within that, um, end of the political spectrum to, to allow for more spending. So when you have um, gender imbalanced representation, the kinds of policies that um, get decided upon don't necessarily reflect the preferences of the underlying population in a way that they would if there was more gender balanced representation. Um, and then finally to this list of um, descriptive, symbolic, and substantive representation, I would also add um, concerns about the quality of representatives. Um, and basically the idea is here, you know, the broader pool of talent that we consider for any type of job, the more likely it is that we are to find talent. Right, so if we look at college admissions in the United States and we think back um, to the Ivy League in 19, the 1950s, one of the things that characterized the, the Ivy League was this idea of a gentleman C. Right? The average person who went to an Ivy League school was kind of a C student. C was an average grade. Um, today, people talk a lot about concerns about grade inflation. But if we think about why the grades at Harvard might have gone up over the intervening 50 or 60 years, we can think about how Harvard admits students. Right? In the 50s, it was Protestant men from New England. So the best Protestant men from New England went to Harvard. Then Harvard started admitting people from across the country, right? They started to become more religiously diverse. They started to become more ethnically diverse. They started to admit women. And now they admit people from all around the world, right? So to get into Harvard now, unless you have hundreds of thousands of dollars to bribe people, um, <laughs> is really tough. Right, because Harvard is looking everywhere for the top talents. Um, and so there's not too many C's at Harvard anymore because gentlemen C's don't get into Harvard. Right? So if we're looking for political representation, representatives from a broad, the broadest possible segment of our society, we're probably more likely to find talented people. And if we think about the job of a representative, right? the job of a representative is to um, talk to the people in a in um, the, the electorate or in the constituency, find out what their needs are, represent those needs, um, and try to come to some policy uh, positions to, to represent or to act on citizens' needs. That's a, a, a skill that's probably widely distributed within the population. So the broader we look, the more likely we are to find it. Um, and there's also extensive research that shows more diverse groups of people are, make better decisions. Right? So if we think about the story of the blind people and the elephant, right? if you just have elephant, you know, four people looking at the elephant's legs, touching the elephant's legs, they're going to say this is an animal that has, it's like a tree. Right? And if you have somebody who's standing by the tail, they could say, well, it feels like the twig of a tree, really, not the trunk. And somebody who has the trunk might say, oh, it feels more like a snake. And somebody who's holding onto the ear might say, oh, it feels like a 
span, you know, and if you put all those perspectives together, you get a pretty good picture of an elephant, right? But if you only have two people looking at the legs, you're not going to get as good of a picture. Um, and so if you have a diverse set of representatives, you're probably more likely to come up with a good um, solution to a particular problem. So for all these reasons, there's a lot of concern globally now about getting more diversity in political representation and using quotas as a means to do that. So how did that work out in Germany? Um, quotas started in Germany and they started worldwide uh, in the 1980s in uh, Germany and other northern European countries where green parties started to come to power. And green parties said, we, we're not happy with politics as usual. We want to fundamentally change political life and fundamentally change political parties as organizations. So one of the things that the Greens did when they came to power, or even well, not even before they came to power, when they started to form parties, is they said, we are not going to have a single leader of our party. Right? You can't have gender diversity or any other kind of diversity if you only had one leader. So for all of our inter-party leadership positions, we're going to have co-leaders. We're going to have a male and a female co-leader. So this is the Green Party today, and these are their two leaders. Um, and the Greens also said, we're going to pick candidates for elective office in a different way, um, a way that's never been done before. And to understand that, we need to understand um, a little bit about how Germans elect um, their legislative branch. So this is a ballot that Germans get, and for those of you who know German, this says you have two votes. So when people go to in Germany go to vote for the Bundestag or for their legislative branch, they get to cast two votes. Half of the Bundestag is elected through this part, which is called the first vote, um, and it works exactly the same way as we elect the House of Representatives here. Germany is divided up into 299 electoral districts. In each electoral district, a political party here, this is the name of the party, can pick one candidate, and here's the name of the candidates. The voters pick one candidate to represent their electoral district, and the person who, wins, who gets the most votes wins and goes to Berlin and serves in the legislative branch, just like here. The Greens didn't change that at all. But the other half of the Bundestag is elected in a different way. And it's elected through a system that's called proportional representation, which we can see over here. And the second vote that Germans cast is not for a person, but for a political party. So here, these are the names of the parties. And each party makes a list of candidates. So because I'm not good at math, I'm just going to say right now that this is for 100 people to go to the Bundestag. It's actually more than that, but my math is, makes it too hard. So we figure there's 100 seats to be elected in the Bundestag through this mechanism. What parties do is make a list of candidates. So if there's 100 seats, they make 100, put 100 people's name on a list in rank order. And voters cast their vote for a party. And parties win seats in the legislature in proportion to the percentage of the vote that they get. So we could imagine a situation in the United States where we had a Republican list, a Democratic list, a Libertarian list, and a Green list. And if the Republicans won 33% and the Democrats won 33% and the Libertarians won 33%, they'd each get 33 people. The top 33 people on their list would be elected. So the Greens said, when we make our lists, we are going to make our list using what's come to be known as a zipper quota. So if we think about zippers, right, they have teeth on either side and the teeth go together. So when the Green Party makes a list, all of the odd-numbered candidates are women, all of the even-numbered candidates are men, and they put the list together. And then depending on what percentage of the vote they get, they just go down the list and it gets them 50-50 representation. Um, so the Greens started to do this, and that's what got that initial increase in the percentage of women that we saw in that first graph with the blue line. Um, what started to happen is that this Green Party started to become very successful. Um, and female voters from the Social Democratic Party, which is a, another left-wing party in Germany, started saying, hey, you know what? Look, the SPD isn't really running, running too many male candidates, but the Greens are up on this, so we're going to start voting for the Greens. So the Social Democrats started losing votes. Um, 
And so the Social Democrats decided, oh, hey, maybe we too could adopt a quota. Um, and so today, when the Social Democrats put together their list for Bundestag elections, they do the same thing as the Greens. They have a 50-50 zipper quota. They have not had a quota for um, their party leader, so they have a single party, whoops, excuse me. They have a single party leader, Andrea Nalas, um, but they have um, a quota that says for every five leadership positions in our party, um, there can't be more than three people of one sex. So Andrea Nalas has a, a male deputy, um, thanks to their quota. Um, as soon after that, in Germany, another party came on the scene. That's this party up here, the left party. They do the same thing as the Greens. They have um, co-male and female leaders, and they have a zipper list quota. Um, the right side of the political spectrum, which I see now is actually on your left, but these parties over here, um, were slower to adopt quotas. This is Merkel's party. Um, what started to happen is that Merkel's party started losing uh, female voters to parties of the left, again, because of this quota issue. Um, and so they also adopted, they don't call it a quota, they call it a quorum, but it's the same regulation where it's one out of every three people on the list has to be female. Um, and the same thing within parties, one out of three people in the party have to be female. So Merkel, for many, many years, is a, was the head of the, the Christian Democratic Party. When it looked like she was going to be forced out recently, she decided that she was, she decided that she was going to retire. Um, and this is the person who went to succeed her. So if we look at German parties, um, four of the six major parties now are headed by women. Um, parties, uh, the Free Democrats and the Alternative for Germany, don't have quotas. They did not adopt this policy. But interestingly, in the 2017 election, this party, the Alternative for Germany, made a big deal about how they were having two lead candidates. And so everywhere they went, they had a male and a female lead candidate come to, um, come to events. Um, and so because of these quotas, we've seen changes in the composition of the German parliament. Um, and so we can see here, um, these are people who were elected through that proportional, elect, uh, proportional representation section of the ballot in parties that use quotas. And we can see the dark color is women and the light color is men. And we can see that we've achieved um, parity 50-50 in the Bundestag through those means. If we look at that other portion of the ballot, right, the, the part where candidates are being elected just like they're being elected here, um, and if we look at the candidates from parties that don't have quotas, we see an outcome that looks a lot more like the United States. Right, where you have um, a little bit over 20% um, women and uh, almost 80% men in those types of seats. Um, so I said earlier, uh, this election result in 2017 was greeted with a lot of hand-wringing in Germany because the percentage of women went down. Um, and the reason for that was because um, a new party that had never won seats before, the far-right uh, alternative for Germany, um, won a lot of seats in the Bundestag. And they don't use a quota, and they have a very male-dominated um, uh, caucus within the parliament. You can see them here, and we can see what they're doing again. They put Elisa Vidal, one of the very, very few women they have, right in the front row, in the front bench. So it looks like they have gender balanced uh, representation, but if we see their back backbenchers, um, it looks pretty male. So, and the Free Democrats, which who had also not been previously in the Bundestag the last time around, also made a comeback. So the two parties without quotas. Um, elected a lot of men, which is why the numbers went down. Um, but we can also see Merkel's party here, the Christian Democrats, they only have 20% um, women, 80% men in their parliamentary delegation. And that result comes because they win a lot of these directly elected seats. So they, they don't get very many people through the proportional representation system because of some complexities of the German electoral system that you don't really want to know all about. Um, so as a result of these um, changes uh, in 2017, we've seen a lot of voices being raised in Germany to change the quota policy. Um, and one thing that a number of party leaders have started calling for are what are called legislated quotas. So the parties that, we've have, that we had before, I said here, I have this word voluntary underlined, right? The parties decided to do this. Nobody made them do it. Other countries have what are called legislative quotas, which says in the electoral law, a party must have a gender balanced list or it's not allowed on the ballot. 
So if we look at Spain, if we look at Belgium, um, those are proportional representation systems where if a party does not have a gender balanced list, it's not going to appear on the ballot. Um, and so that makes parties pretty quickly locate female candidates. Um, Another, so that's been debated at the national level, and it was just uh, voted in in one German state. So Brandenburg is one of Germany's 16 states, and they just adopted a legislative quota for, for state elections um, in their state. Other people in Germany have started calling for a quota for the first vote, so for this, this electoral system that looks a lot more like ours. Um, and there's a number of ways that we could envision quotas working there. Um, one possibility would be um, what's called a rotational quota, um, where we can think about using quotas combined with term limits. So you have one term where a man holds the seat, and when his term is up, then you have a woman hold the seat for her term, and when it's up, then men um, get the seat again, and it rotates like that. Um, another way of doing it is to think about um, pairing electoral districts. So if we take the state of Utah, for example, right, you have four congressional districts. You could say the Republicans need to nominate a woman in two of those districts and, and t men in two of the districts and the same thing with Democrats. So you get parties um, putting different candidates of different sexes in different um, electoral districts. So those, those ideas are being discussed right now in Germany at the national level, and we'll see um, what happens next. Um, so now what I'd like to do is to turn attention to some of the advantages and disadvantages of quotas, thinking about those same measures that we talked about before. Um, quotas are super effective at achieving gender parity in descriptive representation. If the quotas are properly designed and if they're actually enforced, we can engineer 50-50 representation in any legislature around the world. Um, and this here is a list of, um, this is from um, the Interparliamentary Union. They count the number of women and the or percentages of women and percentages of men in national legislatures all around the world and they rank them. So these are the top 10 most gender equal legislatures around the world right now in 2019. Um, and these top 10 countries all use quotas in some way, shape, or form. Um, so you can, quotas are a pro of quotas, and, and the reason why I think um, a lot of people have embraced the solution is that they're effective in increasing um, or achieving gender balance in descriptive representation. Um, we can also see that where quotas are used and the gender balance of government increases, where more women are in visible political positions of power, women's and girls' political knowledge and interest go up. Right, so they are more engaged and more knowledgeable um, about the political system in these kind of settings. So again, if we're trying to get citizenry engaged and interested in democracy, quotas seem to be effective in achieving that. Um, we also have increasing amounts of evidence that show when women get elected, it changes the kinds of policy outputs that governments produce. So cross-nationally, we can see um, that um, where there are a number of women in government, governments are more likely to provide uh, maternity leave and child care, and that's certainly true in the German case. So um, not only does Germany have paid parental or paid maternity leave, um, for a year, but they also have paid paternity leave, so men can also spend six months at home with a newborn, um, courtesy of the German government. They've gone um, far in uh, expanding Germany's network of uh, daycare facilities. Um, they've gone far in um, extending some of the school days. So German schools used to um, basically get out at lunchtime, and the, they didn't have cafeterias, and the idea was that kids would go home and have lunch, which made it difficult for both parents to work because somebody had to be home to make lunch. So German schools are now starting to build cafeterias and serve cafeteria food, which, depending on your experience, may or not may not be considered a, a public policy plus. Um, but it certainly enables um, greater participation in the workforce. Other studies have shown that where women are better represented in government, governments spend more on health care than they do the military. So they take resources away from trying to harm people and put them toward trying to help people. Um, new research come, that came out this year indicates that um, uh, where a lot of women are in um, positions of po political leadership, asylum policies better reflect women's needs, um, the needs of, of female asylum seekers, um, and also that there's a causal relationship reducing corruption. Um, so there have been a number of um, ways in which 
government outputs have changed as uh, a result of including more diverse people in decision making. Um, and then finally, if we look at the quality of legislators, um, we can also see that quotas have helped improve the quality um, of people. And I think that this is an important result because a lot of people, a lot of people argue against quotas saying, well, you know, if, you know, if women were really good at politics, they would have already been elected. And so they're probably not particularly good. And that's not why, you know, that, that's why, um, that's why they're underrepresented. And if we have a quota, we're going to be forced to elect unqualified people or untalented people. Um, and I think that uh, logically, that argument doesn't make very much sense. Um, uh, because if we think about political parties, what kind of incentive do they have to keep running unqualified candidates over and over and over again, right? Either they're going to have to start looking for people to find talented people, or they're going to have to start training people um, to find talented people. Um, and so we can see there's actually an association between quotas and improved legislator quality. Um, so one study that was done in Sweden, Sweden has a very interesting, um, for social scientists, phenomenon that they have um, they have mandatory military service for men, so all men have to go to the military. And when they are um, drafted, the first thing that they do is they take a test to study their aptitude um, for being a military officer, which is actually just an IQ test. Um, and so Sweden has a giant database of all the IQs of Swedish men attached to their social security number. Um, and when Swedish men run for office, they have to give their social security number to get on the ballot. So we also have um, IQ information associated with candidates in Sweden over a long period of time. And when Sweden uh, adopted part, uh, quotas and when Swedish women's participation went up, the IQ of um, the elected men went up too, right? Because basically what was happening was the low IQ ones were getting replaced by um, female aspirants. Um, we can also see in Germany that the adoption of quotas led parties to start training candidates. So women felt maybe they weren't, comp they weren't confident about running, maybe because they hadn't seen women holding positions of political leadership before. So German parties started training their candidates, uh, but not only women, also men, right? So as a result, German candidates are actually better prepared to run for office than they were before. They have public speaking courses, they have like civic education courses that explain how local governments work and the jobs of local councils. So now people who wanna run for office, male or female, get more training than they had before the quota era. Um, and the other thing that quotas have done is to start um, German parties looking for candidates for office in different places. Um, so to give an example, in Germany, um, German uh, counties run hospitals. And so people who were looking for county, or parties who were looking for county commissioners often always used to put doctors on their slate of candidates because they thought, oh, doctors know about the hospital. Um, and when they adopted quotas and they needed to find female candidates, they suddenly realized, oh, actually, you know what? Women work at the hospital as nurses. So now they have doctors and nurses running uh, for uh, elective office and getting elected. And so when they make healthcare policy, they actually have a broader kind of um, range of information to work with because they have a broader set of candidates running. So quotas have done, um, ha have had a lot of positive r results um, in a lot of those areas. Um, some people are very critical of quotas. One reason is that um, there's the argument that by adopting quotas, the state kind of unfairly limits citizens' ability to pick candidates or to pick who will represent them. Um, and I, I personally find this argument rests on a false premise. Um, it kind of assumes that the state is neutral and we can just pick anybody to represent us nowadays. But actually, we're already limited in who we can um, pick. So if we think about Utah, Right, Utah's only allowed to have two senators. You're only allowed to have two represent or four representatives. Right, so there might be three people in the state who are going to be great senators, but you're not allowed to send them. You got a quota. You've got two, and that's it, or four, and that's it in the House. Um, if we think about parties, right, there might be two great Democratic candidates or two great Republican candidates, but parties are already limited. They only can put up one candidate in a race here. Um, if we think about our system, right, it doesn't give third parties a chance. And if we think about our system, it also means basically you have to be rich to run for office. 
So we're not working with neutral rules to begin with. So if we change those rules um, to accommodate gender, I think we're not really doing anything that we haven't done before. Um, and I want to leave um, with this note. Quotas in Germany have been super effective at raising um, women's percentages among elected um, officials because they've required that women are selected as candidates and they're selected as candidates by the political parties that pick candidates. So in this end of the spectrum of what it takes to go from being a citizen to being an elected official, quotas have been really effective. What quotas in Germany haven't done is they haven't worked at this earlier phase um, of the, the causal chain of events. So aspirants are people who want to run for office. Um, they have not really done um, a huge amount to change um, the aspirations of German women. So if you ask German women, um, do you want to run for office, they're less likely to say so than um, our men, even though in practice, actually, they are um, as likely or more likely to do so. Um, and what they haven't done is they haven't encouraged women in Germany to get the qualifications they need to run for office. Um, and in Germany, that qualification is being a political party member and being a leadership, a leader role in the party. So if we look at Germany, again, this is the figure I showed before, quotas um, have gotten us 50-50 representation, but they haven't gotten us 50-50 representation in political parties, right? So German women are still shying away from taking those first steps toward a candidacy. So what quotas have done is they've um, encouraged or helped women who are interested in politics and do want to run to run and be successful, but they've been less successful in attracting a broad swath of people to the very kind of core institution of, of democracy or German party democracy, which is political parties. Um, so in that sense, quotas have had um, a limited effect. And so when I wrote my book, what I really wanted to call it was a glass half full, and I wanted to put this on the cover. I got that boring cover Wade showed because that's what the publisher wanted, and they also wanted a boring title. Um, so I think quotas, they, the glass is full in that they've gotten um, gender parity in people who are elected, but the glass is still half empty in the sense that they still haven't um, included women in all phases of political life, and I think that we need to go further. Those are kind of the next steps that I see um, in ensuring that, that the participation in democracy extends to all phases of the democratic process and not just to the end. Um, so I'll stop here and I'll take any questions that you might have. Okay, I know some of you have to uh, go to class. If you'd like to ask a question again as we normally do, please come to the microphone. Uh, tell us who you are, what you're studying, if you're a student. And, um, right, and then just because we want the audio, because we're filming this as well for the question as well as the response. So thank you. Thank you so much. I really enjoyed your presentation. Is this on? I don't, I don't think so. <laughs> Thank you so much. Really enjoyed the presentation. Uh, I teach human rights transitional justice, and, and then I also do research on substantive representation of women um, and domestic violence laws around the world. And, and so my question for you is um, this, of all areas of substantive representation, the most highly studied is women in parliament around the world. Um, in what other areas do you see researchers extending the substantive representation of women, not just from parliament, but do you see it in corporate boards? Do you see it in executive ministries? Where do you think the research will follow and get as detailed in that area as in parliament? Thank you so much. You're welcome. Um, that's a, that's a, a good question. Um, and I think it's, when you talk about corporate boards, that's interesting because we can also think of, in the German case, right, quotas diffused across the party spectrum. So they went from party family to party family. Quotas have also diffused across areas. So what happened in the Nordic countries was that women made great strides in politics and then people realized, oh my gosh, look at our corporate boards. Our corporate boards look really different than our, our political system. And so um, Scandinavian countries and actually Germany too have now adopted corporate board quotas um, as well. So we see women's participation in economic decision making increasing. So there's a, there's a good bit of literature about that. Um, there is 
literature that's expanding now and I think is really important is thinking about um, women's participation in cabinets and actually some of that literature that I cited really does actually draw more on, on cabinets um, than legislatures because of course the cabinets are really important for drafting legislation and agenda setting and so some of these um, some of these differences or some of these ways in which substantive representation um, makes itself known is really in some of the more smaller details of, of policy making rather than kind of big picture um, legislative um, issues. And the same is true, I think, within, within the bureaucracy. So there's also an increasing literature in political science about what difference it makes um, that women are in um, administrative positions as well. And they use, it's very interesting, they use different terminology because I guess the public administration literature talks about active and passive representation. Um, and I, I now forget which is which, but it, it maps onto this, but they use different words for it. Um, but there is, there is a good bit of political science literature. So I think really, and I think part of this um, methodologically, a lot of this stuff has been difficult to study, right? Because if women aren't represented in leadership positions, then it's really difficult to study what they do. Um, but now that we see um, you know, increasing diversification in leadership positions, I think there's just empirically, there's more to study. Thank you. yeah. You're welcome. Hi. So I think if I saw the map correctly, that there are a lot of quotas in South America. Mm -hmm. um, yes. And that doesn't strike me as the most like gender equal mm -hmm. place. So what is the, the reasoning behind that and mm -hmm. how successful has it been in Latin America? Mm -hmm. That's a really good question. And that's um, in the literature about quotas, one thing that we can see is that it's much, much easier to establish a quota in a new democracy than in an old democracy. Um, and so actually, um, uh, a lot of the countries that have adopted these quotas. The reason why this, we see this spreading in Latin America is basically as military dictatorships started to fall um, and be replaced by democracies, there was increased attention to human rights um, uh, violations and overcoming human rights violations. And so one of the, um, one th thing that quota advocates said was that if we're gonna make democracy, we need to make a democracy that serves all of our citizens. And so quotas are a way to do that. So that I think that's that was kind of the political window of opportunity that opened. So actually the world's first legislative quota um, came from Argentina um, as part of, of dealing with the past in Argentina. So they've done a, um, a really good job of um, uh, improving gender balance in legislatures. Some of the quotas in, in Latin American countries like Brazil, for example, are poorly designed. Um, and so they haven't really led to an increase in, in descriptive representation. But other countries like Argentina, they've done a great job. Um, there's a really good book that's called um, Gender Quotas in Latin America's Big Three that looks at the experience of quotas in Brazil, uh, Peru, and Argentina, I think. And there's some good evidence that shows um, about the substantive representation and decision making, how there's been a lot of efforts to combat um, violence against women in Latin American countries that are probably definitely due um, to, to women's quotas. So for example, in Latin America now, there's special um, police forces and special offices that are set up to deal with domestic violence. Um, and those are kind of legislation that came out of having uh, more women in, in elective office there. Thank you. Hey, you're welcome. Hi, my name's Hi. Cardston Stanford. I'm studying international relations. And then my question is, how do these parties and these countries that have these quotas reconcile the fact that sometimes it'll be two women or maybe two men that are the most qualified candidates and they have to put somebody in between these top two? Um, I, I, I don't... Um, I don't think that m most parties that have adopted quotas have felt that that was a problem. Um, it's certainly true that they do have to to they have to alternate people. Um, but I, you know, I think there's there. Initially, when the Greens wrote their quota, the Green quota technically says all the odd numbered places have to go to women, and all the even numbered places could go to anybody. Um, and subsequently, when parties developed quotas, they changed that um, because I think that men felt that actually the risk was more that they might be excluded from some of those top positions. Um, I think generally, um, because when we when we look at the way quotas are used in Germany, um, 
in proportional representation, parties have a long tradition, and I think this is why quotas were actually relatively uncontroversial in a lot of places in Western Europe. They have a long tradition of trying to balance the candidates on their list. So, you know, they if you're going to pick 10 candidates, you know, for Utah, you don't want everybody to be from Provo, right? You've got to have somebody from Salt Lake and from different areas of the state. You don't want everybody to be 50 years old. You know, you want maybe somebody who's older and somebody who's younger. Maybe you want to have different racial or ethnic or religious diversity in your list. Um, and so um, parties in Europe have long seen the the merit, you know, diversity as being uh, an an asset that a candidate brings to a list. If everyone looks the same, that's not a particularly good list. So in that sense, I think people, um, it, it's relatively less controversial. Certainly, of course, if you're competing for a spot, you want the highest possible spot, right? But generally, I think the way it works with parity quotas is because it's zipped lists, you're making two lists. So you, women are duking it out for the certain positions, and men are duking it out for certain positions, and they're not really comparing each other to each other. They're competing against one another. So I think that, that type of um, situation doesn't come up as often as people think it would. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Hi, I'm Lauren Olson. I'm an international relations major. And my question is, um, so obviously looking at the map, the United States was gray. We don't have any quotas. But what's kind of the conversation looking like in America of like, are there people that are pushing for that? Does it seem likely that it might happen in the near future, distant future? What does that conversation look like? Um, I think... Uh, that conversation is probably very limited in the United States. One of the problems if, for us in our political system is the way that we select candidates, right? So we use primaries to select candidates. And so um, it's, it's not a system like the German system where a party is making you know, choosing who's gonna be on the ballot. I think if we look at the United States, there has been, I think the initial kind of um, response was we need we need to fix women or we need to encourage women to run so we're going to start things like Emily's lists or Ruth lists or these different um, the Susan B. Anthony list or you know whatever the different lists are we're going to get um, uh, groups together who are going to fund w women candidates or going to train women to run so there's a number of different kind of organizations out there in the United States that provide candidate training programs um, so like what, my campus we have a group called Running Start they're based in DC and they come and facilitate a workshop for to basically to encourage people to run for um, uh, on campus office student government positions um, because if we look at the percentage of women in, in Congress who hold student or percentage of anybody in Congress who have held student government positions it's pretty high um, and so I think a lot of the efforts in the United States are in those kind of encouraging and um, training types of programs. But I think that there's some, some um, limits to that. And there's also now, I think, increased attention of trying to just highlight um, who parties are nominating or what um, the balance of, of elected officials look like. Um, I think there are groups that are thinking about electoral reform. And I think that those are that's probably more of a conversation here than thinking about quotas, right? Because if we could do proportional representation, um, then we, or we can do like an instant runoff system, then we have more chances for more candidates to at least be considered. Thank you. But things could change, so we'll see. Probably ORB has its own local political female activism. Uh -huh. um, and then they prepare you to be uh, wherever you want to start, city councilor, et cetera, and then eventually they move you to train to become a senator. It's, it's mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. And those are those are the kind of things that have proliferated in Germany too. And I think really they've helped they've wound up helping everybody. Right. So we, we learn everybody can learn about how they might do that and, and get elected. Hi, my name is Natalie Tonks and I'm studying international relations here. Um, I thought it was interesting how you talked about like there are different issues that women see differently because of their lived life experience. And I totally agree with that. I think that everybody sees, you know, the world in different lenses mm -hmm. because of their life experience. Mm -hmm. And people that have served in the military see foreign mm -hmm. policy really differently because of, you know, their life experience. But, and, like, I've been raised really religiously, and so I see the world, you know, sort of through that lens. Mm -hmm. um, but I think it's interesting that we don't see quotas for those sort of things. Um, and I was wondering if you think that, like, the predominant lens that we see the world through is our gender, and that's why we have people calling for quotas in that way. Um, that's that's um, 
I should have caveated or bracketed my, or I try, I like tried to get that at, at that a little bit. Um, I think one of the biggest things that people have realized, I guess, in, in answer to your question, also where things are going, is that um, one thing that people have realized as about a result of quotas is that there actually is a lot more to life than than just gender, right? And so that if we have quotas that get, you know, a bunch of women who went to Harvard elected, that's not really gonna, you know, they have they bring a certain perspective to office, but that's not necessarily the perspective um, of all women. And so different countries have different um, types of quota policies. Um, if we look at Merkel's um, party, for example, um, a, a lot of people have attributed Merkel's success not only to the fact that she's a woman, but also to the fact that she's Protestant, because her party is a primarily Catholic party, but they want Protestants. Um, they've also attributed to the fact that she's from the East, and her party's predominantly Western, and they want Easterners. And so if they appointed Merkel to stuff, they got a woman, a Protestant, and an Easterner. Um, and so she brought a bunch of different perspectives to the table. So in Germany, um, a lot of those types of um, attributes are actually are taken in, uh, into account by parties. So German parties also have different rules about age, um, about place of residence, um, informally um, about religion. Some of the parties of the left are now trying to make sure that they include people of immigrant background. Um, and different countries around the world actually do have quote. There are countries that do use quotas um, for, for um, religious or ethnic reasons as well. So um, another country that I've done research on is New Zealand. Um, and New Zealand has an, an indigenous pop population called the Maori, and they actually have reserve seat quotas for Maori um, representatives. So you could imagine quotas to get all sorts of different kinds of, of diversity. Thank you. You're welcome. All right, well, join me in thanking uh, our speakers. Thanks to you all for coming. <laughs>